Download your favourite apps with Huawei Petal Search. Download now. Well, thank you, everybody. Good morning. Um, over the last week, New Zealand has learned with horror the systemic failures that have been occurring at our border. The current arrangements at the border have been established in an ad hoc and reactive way. This has resulted in confusion both in government at departments and between ministers. We have recently learnt ministers did not know that the strategy they signed off in June this year only required voluntary testing of border workers. And we wonder, did they even read it? They say they had to update the strategy in July with a new cabinet minute. This was only nine days before the first evidence of an outbreak emerged. They now blame officials for the miscommunication. Government is about being responsible and taking responsibility, not passing the buck when things go wrong. The system established by this government was always prone to miscommunication. The current government's approach requires people entering the border to interact with customs, primary industries, Ministry of Health, the Defence Force, private hotels, private bus drivers, private security and so on. And all of this is coordinated by a senior military official reporting to the Minister of Housing. It's no wonder there was confusion. It's no wonder we today find ourselves in a situation with a third of the country in a Level 3 lockdown and the rest of the country in a Level 2 lockdown. The current approach was set up in an ad hoc way, reacting to an emerging situation. It is now clear heightened border management will be required for the foreseeable future. Even beyond a vaccine, there will likely be heightened procedures at the border for some years to come. And just as we have had SARS, MERS, swine flu and now COVID-19, we will see new threats in the future. We now all too clearly understand the need to respond to public health threats in a coordinated and rapid way. Just as 9-11 changed the way we travel forever, almost 20 years ago, COVID-19 now also means the world is no longer the same. I am announcing today that a national government will immediately move to establish a new border protection agency. To Korowai Fakamaru can be translated as the cloak of protection, and it is an appropriate description of how the agency will protect New Zealanders and envelop them in the safety of the Korowai. The Korowai instills a sense of pride for many New Zealanders, and a Korowai is made up of many threads that together are strong and often tell the story or whakapapa of a family. We see the Border Protection Agency in the same way, many threads woven together to make one cloak of protection. The Border Protection Agency will be created to provide professional coordination and comprehensive management of the potential entry of COVID-19 and other public health threats. The agency will provide the necessary recourses and resources to provide the strong first line of defence. The agency will report to a single minister whose focus will be keeping New Zealand free from the risks of COVID-19 and other pandemic threats. The Border Protection Agency, or Tokorowai Whakamaru, will not replace any current ministry or department, but would draw on resources across government. The agency will have overall control of the response when dealing with an outbreak, including the ability to order compliance with agency policies and oversee the response from other agencies. And the agency will scale up and down as threats emerge and abate. Staff working on the border will be seconded into the agency, trained by the agency and responsible to the agency. This will create a single line of command, consistent training and allow efficient management of border staff testing. We will avoid the current confusion. Te Korowai Whakamaru will be resourced to act as a centre of expertise with the personnel, technology and capability to provide a world-class defence against COVID-19 and any other future pandemic outbreaks. National will require all people travelling to New Zealand to provide evidence of a recent, within three days, negative COVID-19 test prior to boarding their plane. This follows the practice of other countries around the world. 
National will require all new entrants and border workers to carry contact tracing technology. This will allow immediate tracing of contact between border workers and any COVID positive new entrants. And of course, National will require compulsory weekly testing of all staff working at the border or in quarantine facilities. A strong border will require multiple lines of defence. National will also strengthen our second line of defence, rapid contact tracing and testing. New Zealand cannot afford to yo-yo in and out of lockdown every time a case of COVID-19 is detected. As outlined in the Verrill report, rapid contact tracing can help avoid the need for prolonged lockdowns. New Zealand's contact tracing system can be much better. We are reliant on human memories. We need systems that are not so prone to human error. New Zealand's current tracing app has only been downloaded by a third of New Zealanders to enhance contact tracing capability for the general public. National will immediately bolster the campaign to increase the use and take-up of the current COVID-19 tracing app. And National will make contact tracing compulsory for new entrants and border workers. A strong border is vitally important to our economy. And it is also vitally important to public health. A more efficient and coordinated border approach is utterly critical to our economy. Yo-yoing in and out of lockdown is not sustainable for our businesses, for our communities, for our people. It is also not good enough and it needs to change. Our economy must become more resilient to the threats posed by COVID-19 and future pandemics. National will deliver. Thank you. We're ready to take some questions. Uh, sorry, the Minister of uh, Housing and Managed Isolation has just announced that the government will be commencing a pilot of the COVID card inside managed isolation facilities. So what's different about your policy? Well, what we've seen is that the current government has been very good at making promises. They've simply been utterly remiss when it comes to making sure things get done. What you can know with us is that we would make things happen. We would not just have the Minister of Housing in charge of this issue uh, with no overall authority across other agencies and their responses. So you can be certain of this, Did you get as New Zealanders post? can, is that we will make it happen. Did you get picked at the post? Not at all. I think New Zealanders have been sold a pup by the current government. But I think it is important to understand that this is a serious issue. And it is good that the current government has now come on board with our proposal. Requiring a test um, for returnees three days prior to their departure, why do you think that's important? People might see that as a bit pointless if it is three days out. What if they catch it from the Uber driver dropping them off at the airport? Things like that. It is. It, it, do you want to answer that? But I, I'm happy to um, say that that is one of the strands of it. Obviously, coming into New Zealand, they would still need to have two further tests at three days and 12 days, and they'd have to have uh, a COVID tracing um, mechanism with them, a Bluetooth mechanism. But you want, might want to answer that as well, Dr. Shea. So a number of countries institute exit Can you testing. Can come to the mic, please, Dr. A number of countries institute exit testing or point of departure testing, and we're very strong that if we can have a strong border before people even arrive on the plane, if they know the rules when they come into New Zealand, then that three-day testing or a test within three days of them leaving is a good thing. So, so is it that simply put extra burden, though, on those returnees? It's very important that when we look at what um, any burden on returnees is, is that we also look at the shocking burden that 1.7 million New Zealanders in the Auckland region are currently undergoing, and the fact that all the rest of New Zealanders have at least a level two lockdown. Um, it's always about shared responsibility when it comes to New Zealanders' health, but I think we also have to look at the fact that um, it's a very small price for someone to pay to help keep the country safe. So does that, does that 
test for people before they board a plane? Is that more about expectation setting than it is about okay. useful in a, in a health sense? It is the formality of the test. Clearly, if they're positive, they won't be able to uh, board the plane. But it does set an expectation that there are regulations we have in New Zealand that you will need to comply with before you hop in the plane and an understanding of them. So it's more about expectation setting than it is about... No, it's about the positive test. If you have a positive test, you will not be boarding a plane to New Zealand. And do you have you have you looked into whether you know um, the level of testing across in countries across the world is, is very varied? What if someone was in a country where they literally could not access a test? Would you then bar them from entering New Zealand? These are the criteria they will have to meet if they have an expectation of coming into New Zealand, and so that that's pretty much going to be at their responsibility. We'll set the regulations. We'll make it clear what our expectations are. If you want to come to New Zealand. This is what you have to do. So no Isn't that a breach of the Bill of Rights if, if someone's trying to come back into the country and they can't get a test in their country that they're coming from? Uh, yes, you can answer that. Uh, we're not prohibiting them from coming back. We're just saying if you want to come back and you want New Zealand to be safe, then these are the regulations you need to respond to. So you won't exempt them if they are unable to get a test? No, it's, it's very clear. New Zealand is in a situation of lockdown at the moment, with a third of our country unable to operate in the normal way. Um, clearly, it's always uh, issues like this are always a balance, and I would say that New Zealanders would say that they want us to keep COVID-19 out. We've seen what happens when a less than rigorous approach has been taken. We're not prepared to allow that to happen. Do you, do you accept that there were more instances of community outbreak like we've seen in the last couple of weeks? and that would require some sort of lockdown for some parts of the country? Or are you suggesting that what you've proposed here today will effectively shore up the border and we won't see community outbreak like we have? Well, we have a zero tolerance to COVID-19 being in our community, and it is also important to understand that even with the very best measures in the world, um, it is always possible that something could come through. Having said that, it is much better with the contact tracing that we have in place to prevent that. And if there is any need for any lockdown, it would be based on what is necessary um, and it would be hopefully caught very quickly rather than take out a third of the population. So, sorry, what happens when some, if someone can't get a test? They can't come back isn't that at this stage. Isn't is that, that injecting isn't that steel? Isn't negative redundance because they still have to go into isolation for 14 days? Well, I don't think so at all, and what we've seen is, um, despite the isolation, uh, COVID-19 has been allowed back into the community. I think it's extremely important that we have a rigorous, a strong approach, and that it is tough. New Zealand borders will be tough, but, but they're also smart. Yes. It's easy to have um, just closed down a whole country. It's much more difficult to be able to let people back in or come into New Zealand in a safe way and I am not prepared to allow COVID-19 in our communities. So people still test positive Zealand's... when they arrive back into New Zealand and they go into isolation mm -hmm. and then they are cleared. They can't leave isolation until they test negative and then they're cleared. So isn't testing negative before being allowed in pointless and burden and, and a burden? I suggest no test is actually redundant. In fact, if we look at the number of countries who have uh, exit testing or point of departure testing, they've all found it very useful as well. I think Hawaii may have been the last country that required exactly this. So that, would you prohibit New Zealand citizens from returning to New Zealand if they can't get a test? Is that what you're saying? I'm making it very plain. They need to, to get a test. And that is, we're dealing with a situation uh, where we are looking at an economic crisis. We can't crisis. stop Kiwis from coming home. Well, they can come home, they need to get a test. But and they that's can't get access to a test. Well, I'm sorry, they're going to find, have to find a way to get a test. This is very important um, that we also look at the human rights of the New Zealanders who are here, who are currently in lockdown, or who are, in some cases, in hospital, as I heard the other day, in hospital, they are suffering. I think it's very important that we take this very seriously. What? This is tough. But tough times need tough measures. Do you what think the that the public will be on your side on that? Oh, I, I imagine that the New Zealand public uh, will be very pleased to have tough and smart borders in place. What are the mechanics of actually enforcing that requirement? Would you need New Zealand border personnel at, at foreign airports to check those tests? Or can it be 
long, mandate, mandate, mandated through the airlines. How does that actually work, making sure that people do return these tickets? Usually it's done through the airlines. Uh, so we've explored that. It's an expectation we have of the airlines. And if we need to resource that, then that's what we'll do. During your opening remark, you said that contact tracing would be mandatory for all new entrants. The, your party's policy that you just put out said that you would look at requiring uh, contact tracing for certain people from high-risk countries. So is it everyone or just certain people? No, everybody coming into the country will have to have that. Um, we would obviously also look to, once the technology, we're satisfied with technology, look to make sure that we could actually spread that around the country so that we can prevent these sorts of lockdowns in place. But it has to be compulsory for new entrants into the border, but also for all of those who are working in those border or quarantine facilities. So it would be compulsory for everyone? Who are coming into the country. Just and those working you, out. How realistic is a 60 minute waiting time for a test given the mm -hmm. demands and pressures that we've seen for those who are conducting the tests under it at this point? Well, this is primarily a resource issue. We want to get as much testing as we can. We need to make it easy for people. We've said 60 minutes because that's a lunchtime. And we would suggest that if you're able to <coughs> take time off in the lunchtime, that you'll be able, have a reasonable expectation to be tested. If you're tested at a GP, you would normally make an appointment. So we would expect within 60 minutes you could get uh, that test done as well. We want to make it easy for people to be tested. Is so the target time around getting that result back as well then? The uh, Asheville target time was for a positive, 80% of positives to come back in 24 hours. Uh, we think those indicators are, are still good indicators. And what about people who sit at home self-isolating even when they don't necessarily have to, waiting for a negative result? Yes, it's a long time frame. At the moment we're hearing it's four to five days. Uh, the indicators were less than that, but we understand a positive result is the first result to get out primarily. Yeah, but obviously you'd want people to be back at work and contributing to the economy if they could be, so sitting at home for four or five days is pretty unproductive. Yes, we'd like to be better with the negative test, but again, a positive test is the most important one to convey initially. So you're not going to target on the negative? Uh, Asher Viral had targets on when all the results should come out, and those are the indicators that we're working with. Would this your agency be restricted solely to public health issues, pandemic issues, or could it could there be some mission creep, you know, Border Protection Force in Australia looks at asylum seekers and, and that sort of space. Would there be restrictions to prevent sort of the spread of that at the agency into those areas? Well, it's certainly no intention to do that. We already have customs MPI, we have um, all the mechanisms now that are working. The problem is this is a pandemic situation. Um, and there seems no vaccine at the moment. There's no um, possible, um, let's say, long-term or, or medium-term solution um, that we can foresee for at least a you know a reasonable period of time. So we do need to have it in place for pandemics. But it's also an agency. Um, and if you consider, say, an agency like civil defence that um, builds up for issues and then comes comes back down. Uh, for when it, when it abates, when that's the sort of agency we're thinking about very much here is that we are talking about an agency that's there fit for purpose for pandemic situations so that we don't end up with this mad scramble of different ministers and different agencies and, and some people brought in, some people suddenly in charge, you know, MPI doing something, MB doing something else. Um, no real coordination, and that is what this is. But it's meant they would be explicitly yeah, yeah, public exactly. health only. Yeah, public health issues. So would you, would, you, would, you, would you basically eat away at the PHUs to, to build this agency? Like, where would, where would it come from? The uh, public health units, the 12 public health units, will still have a role to play because they're closer to the, to the regions, they're closer to the people. So they will feed into the centralised NCTS, for example, with contact tracing, and that, that feeds into the Border Protection Agency as a pathway of information. So the PHUs will still have a very important role here because they're closer uh, to, to the population. But presumably you'd have to take staff from somewhere, right? And the people that work in this space are currently working in PHUs and health, you know, wouldn't you wouldn't be sort of um, you know, reducing their capacity by creating this new agency? We've said that we'll train people uh, into this new agency and we'll grow that capacity. We have what we have here now, but we will grow that capacity into the agency. Can I just I confirm as well that you've, you've effectively abandoned the um, policy from June where you wanted international students to be coming into New Zealand through an isolation system managed by universities? Well, I think it's very important that, as the public has seen, that with systemic failure at the border and to protect New Zealanders, that until we can be absolutely 100% safe 
and so and sure about that, it's very important that we have that in place, our border agency in place, working effectively before we look at who we can bring into New Zealand other than returning New Zealanders. In terms so, of sorry, was, that, was, that, was, that, was that policy misguided, do you think? Because there's not... No, not it much, wasn't. It, it wasn't at all. No, it wasn't at all. It was actually. Was no no. Well, the government was being incredibly optimistic at the time uh, about the position that New Zealand had achieved in defeating COVID-19. There was an expectation, and we were told that the border was very, very secure. Uh, that the border management around isolation and other such meant that the chances of COVID-19 getting into the community were very substantially reduced. So in that environment, it was reasonable to look at where to from here. Unfortunately, none of that was true, and so it's quite a different where to from here. What's the difference mm. between your border agency and New Zealand First's border force? Well, um, I saw that they had a press release. Uh, that's all that I've seen from New Zealand First on it. Ours is actually a thought-out policy that we've been working on for a while, um, and... I think, you know, it's, it's very difficult for Mr Peters because he's now having to deal with the fact that he's been part of a government um, that has had such a massive failure in the um, border protection area. So, look, his policy is his policy. You'd need to ask him about it because all I've seen is a press release. There seemed yeah, to be a bit of a debate limit. around imitation between the two of you on Twitter. I thought it was very nice that he wanted to um, come out with one too. Can I just ask, <laughs> the, the Vera report had said that 80% uh, contact tracing would be the gold standard. The government in the early days of this new outbreak hit about 86%. Uh, page four of your new policy says that that was too slow. What should the gold standard be? So um, the current standard that's being touted around is 80% of, of people contacted within 48 hours. If you look at the actual Vera report, it actually said 80% within 24 hours after they'd been notified had been contacted, and then 24% uh, uh, and then 80% after that actually into isolation. So uh, we're not quite within those metrics. We think they're good metrics, and uh, we'll hold ourselves to them. But also, the current tracing is um, primarily is about uh, what people remember when they've been told who you've been in contact with. That's why we think you need to have that multi-pronged approach. And that's what um, actually Dr. Beryl has recommended as well. And you've talked in the past about having trouble getting access to some of the government's experts. Has any of the government's experts helped you put together this policy, say like the chief science advisor or someone? No, no we, we have um, our chief um, health advisor on this issue. We also have people who are virologists and others who uh, work with us and who have been involved in um, helping us form our policy. Just who's that chief health advisor? Just no, I'm, I'm saying Dr Shane Reddy right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, seems to know a lot more than uh, anyone else in the government. <laughs> do you, do you <laughs> have yes. confidence just that, that they're going to put a um, technological alarm around the managed isolation facilities mm -hmm. and use um, temperature technology to make sure no one escapes? Right. That's good policy? <laughs> Well, it sounds like catch-up to me. Um, policy, as um, the Unite Union head said the other day, should be something more than a press release. And, um, and as he said, that's the problem with the government of actually running their policy by a press release, or I would say by cabinet minute and not following through. It's catch-up. It's acknowledgement that they've failed. Thank Would you, Joe. Do you have confidence in the Ministry of Health and those officials and staff who are conducting the testing to actually carry out what you're proposing here? Because if you look at what's happened with the border testing failures and the day three and twelve failures, someone along that line there has been responsible, though we don't know who, for not actually doing what was asked by Dr Bloomfield and the Health Minister. So do you have confidence that they can actually do this stuff? We think they uh, need a clear leadership. We think they need resourcing. We do think they're doing the best they possibly can. We understand that, and, and this is thanks to them. But uh, we think they need clear leadership, clear monitoring, and clear policies, and that's what we're presenting today. Do you think that leadership failure is with the Health Minister, or is that questioning Dr Ashley Bloomfield's ability to run the Ministry? This is what we're exploring when the Minister is saying that he's been misled, and that there's a dissonance. We're also exploring what, who's done the misleading, where's the dissonance. So we're interested in knowing that as well. Do you well, think that's very really clear Bloomfield to us. Of the paper, which yeah. would be yes, it would be interesting. I asked the other day if the Prime Minister would like to um, release all the communications and the paperwork between the Ministry um, and the Government on this. And Because what we've certainly seen is that the Government uh, seemed to think that a Cabinet Minute, uh, which would not be going down to the front line of um, Ministry of Health, would be enough. It is actually a clear failure of leadership. I think the leadership 
issue is primarily with the government and that they need to have uh, be answering for it. So with your border policy in place, can you give us a cast iron guarantee that no COVID will come in under your watch? I can tell you that if any um, COVID-19 were to rear itself through the many um, nets and provisions that we're putting in place, that it would be very quickly stopped so we wouldn't e end up with the sorts of lockdowns that we've seen and we're in at the moment. So wherever it does, it did come in and understand that under health and safety uh, philosophy and, um, and teachings, there is always a chance of something happening. But we have a zero tolerance to it and it's a zero tolerance to lockdowns unless they are needed. So lockdown should be the not the default position, which is what we're seeing at the moment. It should be the last decision we have to take. Just so in terms of this, you wouldn't put us into lockdown. First off, no, not unless you can. If you have the, we had the um, situation of the tracing um, app. If we have the the um, the, the uh, something like a COVID card, a Bluetooth card. If we have all the measures in place, the testing before people leave to go on a plane, the testings after that. If we have the managed isolation and quarantine solid, tough, able to be relied on, we should, if we have any um, COVID in the community, we should be able to very quickly detect where it needs, where people need to be brought back into managed isolation. In terms of those lockdowns you've mentioned in the policy that you want to see targeted and shorter lockdowns, mm. can you just explain that a bit more? Well, if we have the, um, the COVID tracing app being used properly, if we have... Uh, people being able to use something akin to Bluetooth technology akin to a COVID card, we should, should there be any COVID found in the community, be able to very quickly isolate where that has been, where those contacts are. You do that, then you don't need to have 1.7 million people locked down. What it does mean is that you might have part of a suburb, you might have um, you know, a street, it may be um, a, a grouping of people, but it's not a third of the country and the rest of the country in level two. Are you confident that's safe? Yes, I think that is very safe. Mm. And particularly when uh, any new returnees are coming in, because that's where it's coming through. It's coming through the border. It's not just um, suddenly manifesting itself in the country. Um, it's coming through the border. If everybody coming in and anybody interacting with them has to have one of their Bluetooth technologies by compulsion, that is going to help tremendously. How do you lock down a suburb in a city like Auckland? Uh, well, just the same problems we've seen now with the border um, with Auckland, haven't we, where people live outside of Auckland and yet work in Auckland. It is very important that we have cards, for instance, for people to allow them to access through um, any border with a suburb. It means that you be very careful and targeted in what you do. So that's one of the things that the Border Protection Agency would have to put in place, which would be what businesses are um, not only essential but safe, um, how we actually um, operate that. Those would be operational issues for them, and that's why we think an agency needs to be in charge of that. Not the situation we have at the moment, where we've gone from MB in the first lockdown that was issuing um, essential um, notices, worker notices, to now suddenly Ministry of Health. It's just a complete mess, and that one agency will put that in place. Wouldn't you, a suburb lockdown be a logistical nightmare? Everything is a logistical nightmare if you're not prepared, and that's the problem. Is the country the, hasn't is been. Is the prepared. Bluetooth uh, technology reliable? And have you got? Is there um, examples of it overseas where it's working? <coughs> Bluetooth technology is fundamentally a proximity diary, and it has limitations. It can pick up too many people. It cannot pick up enough people. We understand that. That's why it's being trialled. Certainly, the COVID cards being trialled in Rotorua at the moment, and we're hugely supportive of that trial being completed as soon as possible so that we can all take the learnings from that. Are there but examples it, overseas that where it's working? We believe in Singapore and in other, some of the uh, Asian countries that we've seen Bluetooth technology as a useful tool, just one of several <laughs> tools in the toolbox and that's how we're envisaging it as well. But, but the, the take-up wasn't, wasn't as high as it needed to be, so what would you do to ensure the take-up would be 80%? It is probably the uh, cut-off for Bluetooth or the maximum efficiency is at 80%. Uh, we'll be encouraging people. Again, if you make it easy for people to do the right thing, uh, we think they will. So that's how we're going to approach that. Why, why not move <coughs> isolation facilities away from the vulnerable communities in <laughs> South Auckland and Auckland, where the cluster is? Well, I heard the um, proposal in the press release, I think, from uh, New Zealand First, that they should be moved to the military bases. You know, I don't really want to see COVID-19 right throughout our military either. Um, 
And also, if you're moving them into placing or housing that's already got military in them, where, where do you move your military? So it is really important that um, if we're going to have this pandemic with us for some time, that we look at what we, you know, where, where we can shift people to and where it's safe. And that's part of the job of a border protection agency, is to come up with those proposals that Cabinet would then approve. Why are you going with the Bluetooth card rather than focusing on the app? Are you kind of the wheel? No, we're doing both, you see. That's the point. It's both. It's not just one or the other. It's both. And the technology, the Bluetooth technology, um, we haven't settled on any particular um, version of it, but it is important that we take all of the measures together rather than just one or the other. Are you going to make it compulsory because the sign-up for this stuff has just been abysmal? Well, I don't blame New Zealanders. Uh, for believing the government when they told us that they had beaten COVID-19. I don't blame New Zealanders for believing what they were told, because we were all told it. You were told it. Everyone was. We were told that COVID-19 had been beaten, our borders were safe, it wasn't coming in, we were, people were getting tested, they weren't getting tested. Actually, it's one of the tools available to a government, um, the Bluetooth technology. It's that and testing the um, pre-exit testing for when people move from um, get on a plane before they come to New Zealand. It's the actual testing at the borders. It's the uh, security people, everybody involved being tested and taking this seriously. Um, I don't blame New Zealanders for not thinking that the COVID app uh, was of any use to them because actually they saw a government saying, well, everything's going fine. You want to test aged care workers, but you also talk about wider testing within retirement homes. Mm. Are you talking about staff, or are you talking about people who are living within retirement mm. homes with that? We mean both <coughs> staff and uh, retirees who might be retirement homes. What we're reflecting here is that huge risk of that older population, the over 60s, over 65s, and we're wanting to make special steps to take them into account. Because we've been told time and time again that it's quite a vulnerable demographic, and for those of us who have had the COVID test, it's not pleasant at all. So how do you get around, I guess, taking care of those vulnerable people and forcing them to have a test? So the mechanics of the, uh, the test, the nasopharyngeal swab, it can be unpleasant, we understand that, but that is the test that we have at the moment, the PCR. Having said that, we're also interested in the tests that are, you know, that are coming down the line. We've heard about saliva tests this week, uh, the uh, blood test, the antibody test, and these are other opportunities that we can look to. We just don't have them here today. Today it's the nasopharyngeal test that is what will be the requirement uh, for staff and retirees and, and older people. But that could change as those new tests come in, as those new tests come in, Good. and we have confidence so in them. So you'll be requiring retirees to take their test? We'll be requesting and advising that it will be a good practice uh, for retirees uh, and for and staff in vulnerable communities. Like so, so retirement homes we're talking about, yeah, Thomas, yeah. not everyone saying? who's retired. But you're mandating it? You're, you're, you're requiring them to have a test? It will be necessary um, if, you know, it will be necessary. I mean, we're talking about um, homes where people are at absolute risk, and we've seen that already. We've had lockdowns of retirement homes in two of them, I think, in Christchurch. You so can't the, take this. Yeah, yeah, so, like a, so, like a Section 70 Health Act order mm. that says mm. they must be mm. tested. Mm. So, it's the staff. Care the staff who are coming into contact with them and the retirees themselves, that they will they will have them available for them. Um, but also, as Dr Shane said, there's new testing coming through right now, which is actually less invasive and less difficult for people. And once there is confidence in that, that will make it a lot easier. I'm just, I'm just, that, you you, you used two, use two different words here, available and required. Are, are, are the retirees required mm -hmm. to take the mm -hmm. tests under this policy? Or they no, it's the, staff, it's the staff at the, um, in the retirement homes. At the border, it's required for anyone coming in. In the retirement homes themselves, it is something that retirees would be, have, have it available to them. But the staff must be tested. Right, so they won't be required. Must be tested for the staff. The okay. pre-flight tests, how would you authenticate those results? Because mm. I imagine there could be an incentive if, say, you're in the United States and you'll have to pay $6,000 for a test to just work up something on a piece of letterhead. So how would you mm. assure that those are done through approved facilities and that the results can be trusted? Mm, it's a good question. We'd be using the same authentication in laboratories that Immigration New Zealand use when you're required to have Immigration New Zealand testing. There's a set of authorised laboratories, authorised professionals. We'll be using that framework. Mm. Does that make it difficult to then to... Is testing at the border when people arrive? So airport testing or anything like that? Or is it day three, oh, day we have five, the image. 
Yes. Correct. There are three prongs to this. There is the uh, testing, there's thermal imaging, and then a health declaration card. Uh, those will be the three things that will be required as exit testing or point of departure testing coming to New Zealand. In terms you of talked about hour-long tests. How reliable are those? Those hour tests? No, it's an hour to be tested, so you're not waiting in a car oh, line for four or five hours. Uh, we're saying we think it's reasonable to have that test within an hour. Hours. It takes a lot longer to actually oh, yeah. process the test. You haven't considered on Bluetooth technology, so we'll be investigating that, and the yeah. of Bluetooth technology for MIQ workers. How is that different to what the government is already doing? Not clear that they have a well entranced plan for Bluetooth technology. They are investigating uh, it. They're investigating it, but, but where is it today? We're making a commitment to Bluetooth technology. Well, they're committed to trialling the COVID card, and they've just said they're part of the COVID card at MIT facilities for all the staff there. So they've been piling it at Rotorua, where are those results? Well, this, 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 this is yeah. committed to it. Mm, they've held it off there. Yeah. They so also said. So, the yeah. original question how is what you're proposing to well, well, they actually also said they were testing all the border-facing staff, and they were. They also said that um, border-facing staff, some of them were reluctant to get tested, and that's clearly not not correct. We had people who were asking to be tested, and weren't. Um, so they and they said an awful lot, and so they have. The difference is that you will do it. And they well, actually, there's a massive point of difference um, apart from the testing before people get on a plane and the thermal energy with us, and the massive point of difference is that if we say we're going to do it, we will. Sure, but the Bluetooth stuff. What is the point of difference? Yeah. Now? The point of difference is that, is, as the leader has said, uh, we'll be committing to actually deploying it, mm. and uh, we're interested in working with a wide range of developers who can rapidly bring that solution to market. And in terms of the uptake, you were saying that the people weren't downloading the, the, the current app because the government was painting too rosy a picture mm. at the border. So what would you do differently? Would you tell people that the border is porous and that they're always there <laughs> to download the app? <laughs> well, we just make sure that the uh, if you make promises that you deliver on them, and that's something that we... Um, we, we do. We, we're not going to make promises, not deliver. So um, one of the things is, as a minister who's you know, having experienced ministers involved is very important, having ministers who get out and actually talk to frontline staff about what's going on, that's really important. What we've seen is um, basically a complete schmozzle with the Prime Minister saying that she's you know, popped out a cabinet minutes as though that's going to make a difference. It's very important to make sure that things are done and what we know is that um, if we say to, to New Zealanders, look, this app is one of the many tools that we can use to help keep you safe, and it will avoid a yo-yoing in and out of lockdown and the economic damage as well as the health damage that's done by, um, by that, I think New Zealanders will believe us when we tell them that. It is really important that we don't go in and out of lockdown Lockdown should be our last resort, not our first resort. In terms of compulsory contact tracing apps for border workers and others, um, it's one thing to tell them to you know, use their COVID app or whatever. It's another thing for them to actually do it. So how would you enforce that? It's a different um, system for the border workers and those detainees. It's a, a form of a card is what we're, we're thinking about, something like the COVID card, um, whereby people have it on them. If they weren't uh, using it, and there obviously would need to be periodic checks, it would be pretty easy to do that with staff, um, then they wouldn't be working there. They'd lose their jobs. That's the one. Is yep. that a bit hard? No, what's really hard is locking down 1.7 million New Zealanders and costing New Zealanders another $1.6 billion, well, sorry, $1.3 billion for the wage subsidy for the last a couple of weeks. What's really hard are 250 New Zealanders losing their jobs every day in Auckland because of the lockdown. And what's really hard is that they, they do not see an end to yo-yoing in and out of lockdown. That's hard. How often would you require compulsory testing of border-facing staff? Take a hit, you Why is that? Uh, because you, you get uh, a midpoint in the 14-day cycle. So advice we've taken suggests that would be about right. Sherry Browning, is it problematic that Donald Trump has once again called out New Zealand for big outbreaks and uh, or a big outbreak and lots of outbreaks? Well, I don't think we listen to him too much. We don't listen to the President of the United States? Not on, we're, not we're, on insulting stuff like that. We're, that we're very insulting. Focused. It's not uh, exactly friendly. It's, um, it's really important that we understand that New Zealanders are very focused, rightly so, on New Zealanders' own welfare. And, um, and we understand how important it is. I mean, I'm talking to um, 
people every day in Auckland. And um, you know, my own family's in lockdown. Uh, Paul Goldsmith's away from his family in lockdown. Um, you know, many of us are saying um, this is a really tough time for New Zealanders and actually they want us to be focused on them, not about what's happening in a, another country. So when it comes to New Zealand, Donald Trump should just zip it? I think it's always important to be focused on New Zealand and I think that's what New Zealanders expect us to be on. I'm not worried about what anyone says about New Zealand. I, what I care about, particularly when it's wrong, what I really care about is the health in, of New Zealanders and the economy of New Zealand, our safety of New Zealand. That's what's important to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now featuring Petal Search, your gateway to a million apps. Download now. Well, thank you, everybody. Good morning. Um, over the last week, New Zealand has learned with horror the systemic failures that have been occurring at our border. The current arrangements at the border have been established in an ad hoc and reactive way. This has resulted in confusion both in government at departments and between ministers. We have recently learnt ministers did not know that the strategy they signed off in June this year only required voluntary testing of border workers. And we wonder, did they even read it? They say they had to update the strategy in July.